Okay, so uh, this is the first tutorial. The, uh, these problems, if you haven't found them yet, are on Blackboard uh, for the materials for week one. And of course, if you haven't watched the lecture yet on this, you should watch the lecture before you get to this. And I'm now just at this point just going to go through and work some problems and kind of talk through them a little bit of them as I go through. Um, so I'm going to get started. In the first problem here, it says uh, we have a scenario is the average price for a college textbook over $120. So I'm going to write that as a research hypothesis. Now notice it says average, and we have a quantitative variable 120. So our hypotheses for quantitative variables for average are hypotheses about the population mean, mu. So uh, our research hypothesis then is mu over or greater than 120. Again, mu is the population mean. Uh, I could have worded this and probably would on an exam where, where this is, is the population mean price for a po college textbook over $120. So now let's make up some uh, data for that. Uh, and again, I'm just making this up uh, from scratch. Let's say uh, in a random sample, probably should say in a simple random sample. Okay, my fifty textbooks. This seems to be writing really slow. The sample mean price is $127. Okay, so now I have in part A, the hypothesis is the population mean greater than 120. And in part B, a statistic, the sample mean, X bar, is 127. So what are the possible ex explanations for that difference? In this case, the difference between 127 and 120, or the difference of seven. What are the possible explanations? It could be a real difference or it could be sampling error. Now the other thing you could add in here, these are the two we're going to be focusing on most of this course, but you could just say, well, it could have been something else. Maybe the data were in cor uh, correctly uh, uh, obtained or um, I can't think of a whole lot of other things in this case, but I could say something else, something maybe systematic else. Uh, okay, so that's problem one. Let's see how this works here. That's not good. Oh, I didn't want that. I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but um, they, I guess, <laughs> updated the uh, system in this. Uh, Make make the uh, writing on the um, screen here, and uh, sometimes updated changes aren't better than uh, before. And or maybe it is better. I just haven't gotten used to it yet. Okay, so uh, we'll see if I have this writing now. Uh, do over 40% own a, uh, a dog, or is the proportion, Again, I wish I had said here, is the population proportion. Okay, that's not working. Well, 
Well, maybe it's going to work here. Um, is the population proportion of Russellville households who own a dog over 0.4? So they either own a dog or they don't. And we're talking about proportions. Uh, and I should word this is the population proportion, or certainly by the time I get to the exam, I'll make sure I get that in there. But anyway, it has to be P, the population proportion. All hypotheses are about parameters. And mu for means, P for proportions, rho for correlations. And we want to know is it over 0.4? So we could say. Uh, In a random sample, well, the writing is better this time, of uh, 400 Russellville homes, um, 200 own a dog. So I can calculate a sample proportion for that. Remember, the sample proportion is just p hat. And it's going to equal to the number of yeses over the total sample size, or 200 out of 400.5. So 0.5, or 50% of the homes uh, in Russville own a dog in this sample of 400. So that difference between half of the homes owning and 40% owning could be a real difference. Maybe you're going to start seeing a pattern <laughs> here. A real difference means that the population proportion P is greater than 0.4. That's what I mean by a real difference. Uh, the difference between 0.5 and 0.4 could indicate a real difference, or it could just be sampling error. Good. Um, OK, is there a difference between the average time it takes for a web page to load with cable service than the average time it takes for a web page to load with DSL? So we're talking about averages. There's two groups. HR is, is the population mean for group A, that is, those with cable service, is that greater than the population mean, in this case, time it takes to load for those with DSL, letting A be cable service and B being uh, DSL. OK, so uh, let's say uh, this could be we took a random sample of 100 homes with cable. The Average time to load a web page is uh, 2.9 seconds. Then we take another random sample called an independent random simple random sample, an independent just means it's a separate sample. And I should have said simple random sample up here. But an independent now, simple random sample of 100 homes 
with DSL and I got the average is equal to uh, say 3.3 seconds. So my statistic then is going to be x bar A minus x bar B or 2.9, write that here, 2.9 minus 3.3, .3, which is minus 0.04, right, I'm sorry, minus 0.4. So the statistic is x bar A minus x bar B, the difference, which is minus 0.4. I'm going to do one other thing right here just to make uh, a point, and that is I'm going to rewrite this mu A greater than mu B as mu A minus mu B greater than zero. Those are equivalent statements. Uh, the advantage of writing it the first way is it's easier to think of mu A greater than mu B, but the uh, advantage over here is that I'm comparing to, first of all, I say, if mu a is greater than mu b, mu a minus mu b is greater than zero. Now I have a specific number with which to compare this statistic. The hypothesized difference is zero. The difference we found is minus 0.4. Now that we have that difference between no difference of zero and a high, uh, and a sample difference of minus 0.4, we can ask, is that difference a real difference? Now you can answer points part C on all of these, can't you? Uh, or is it sampling error? That wasn't the score for the Orioles. I was going to turn it off. They're getting killed tonight. Okay, so is there a correlation between the advertised selling price uh, and the distance the house is to the nearest coastline. Um, the research hypothesis is that the correlation coefficient, it's not P, it's a rho, it's a slanted uh, correlation. That sometimes I exaggerate it a little bit more even, but the symbol I have here really is uh, pretty close. Is it non-zero? So as long as the correlation isn't zero, which zero is no correlation, then there is a correlation. So we want to see if there is a correlation. Uh, so uh, in a random sample, I'm going to put in parentheses SRS. You'll see that some, and I'll be using it more and more. It just stands for simple random sample. So in this um, simple random sample of, let's say, 500 uh, two-bedroom apartments under 1,500 square feet in the United States, uh, the correlation between 
the advertised selling price. And uh, distance to nearest coastline. is uh, 0.51. In other words, R, this is our sample of 500, is equal to 0.51. So is that a large enough correlation in the sample to help us say that the population correlation is not equal to zero? We'll get to the calculations of that later in the course, but right now we'll just note that there are two explanations for that correlation of 0.51. One of those is that there's a real correlation or a real effect, which would mean that, I should have said here, uh, minus 0.51 would be more realistic there, that the further you get away from the coastline, the lower the price of your house. I think there actually might be some truth to that. So anyway, that could reflect a real correlation or it could just reflect sampling error, which just means that if I took another sample of 500, I would not get minus 0.51, I would get some other number. You'll probably get tired of my coin flipping, flipping example, but sometimes when you flip a coin, you get 0.7, another time 0.3 or 0.8 or 0.5. Um, that's just sampling error, or could just be sampling error. Okay, so is the uh, proportion of Arkansas residents who have bought something at Walmart in the past week higher than the pro proportion of Texas residents? Um, so letting A go for Arkansas and B for Texas, we want to know if the proportion, the population proportion for group A for Arkansas is greater than the population proportion for group B or Texas. So in a SRS, simple random sample of 200 Arkansas residents, hundred and sixty four have made a Walmart purchase in the past week. So P hat A is 164 out of 200 or 0.82. Now we take in an independent, which means separate, Simple random sample of 200 uh, Texas residents hundred and forty have made I'm just going to put a purchase a Walmart purchase in the past week so P hat B is equal to 0.7. That's just 140 out of uh, 200. I'll write that over here. P hat A B is equal to 140 out of 200, which is 0.7. So the statistic in this case is the difference between the proportions P hat A minus P hat B, which is equal to 
0.2 minus 0.7 or 0.12. Let me also come back up here and, and make the same kind of thing I did with the population mean and say that I could have reformulated this as PA minus PB as the parameter, the difference between the two population proportions greater than zero. So now I'm comparing zero and 0.12 and, and trying to decide whether or not the difference between those two, a difference of 0.12 and a hypothesized difference, zero. If that's a big enough difference to say that we have a real difference, in population proportions, or a real effect if you want to call it that, or is that difference just a matter of sampling error? Or could it just be a matter of sampling error? Okay, so a random sample of 100 employees, 80 drove to work a day in a low occupancy vehicle. That is, there weren't any passengers, just the driver. Identify each of the following for this problem. An element is one employee. I'm going to skip down here. Population is all employees. And the sample is... Uh, a simple random sample of 100 employees. Again, one for the element, all for the population, and some, in this case 100, for the sample. The variable is whether or not drove to work today in a low occupancy vehicle. Vehicle. I've never seen it called that before. You have, if you go to a big city, sometimes you'll have the HOV lane for high occupational uh, or high occupancy vehicle. But anyway, low occupancy vehicle, whether or not they drove today to work today in a low occupancy vehicle, that is qualitative. You either did or you didn't. And that is a binomial because there are just two categories. Of course, the values that you could possibly have for that are yes and no. Two categories, that's a qualitative variable. Two categories makes it binomial. The parameter then is P, the population And the sample proportion which is P hat which is equal to X over N where X is the number of yeses, 80, and N is the size of the sample which is 100. Of course in this case I'll just go ahead and write that. It's 80 out of 100, which is 
day in a random sample of 100 employees, one employee, all employees, sum or an SRS of 100 employees, element population sample, one all sum. Variable is uh, the uh, time of commute today, or today's time of commute. That is a quantitative variable, and it's continuous. You're not just counting commutes. It's did it take um, maybe uh, 33 minutes, two minutes, 93 minutes, and so on. Yeah, I could put, by the way, if I were measuring it, uh, 8.24 minutes. So at least if you measure it finely enough, the um, variable here could take on any number in the, uh, in, in the range of possible values. The parameter, it's a quantitative variable, so we're looking at population mean mu. And the statistic then is the sample mean, which is x bar. Okay, we haven't gotten to this formula yet, but I'm going to go ahead and write it in here. The sum of the x is divided by n. And what we do know about that is it's 25.7. I'm going to figure this out sooner or later. Okay, in a random sample of 100 employees, okay, we've seen this one enough. One employee, all employees, okay. Okay, I'm not really sure what happened right then, but. One employee. Oh, I hope what happened, what I think happened, but we'll find out. Uh, number of times late for work in the past six months. Okay, that is quantitative. I was afraid of that. Okay, now I know what happened for sure.
there are two annotation tools on this, and uh, one of them is trying to take the place of the other one. And I don't know if they can uh, take one of them off or not. I suspect actually not. OK, well, anyway. If you would right now, if you would go back to the, uh, and just take a look really quick at the problem that, uh, I have it with me here. Uh, let's just go on with this. Uh, I want to go back. I think I might have circled the wrong thing in one of the previous uh, problems. I think I said it right. I think I said quantitative, but I might have. Okay. Well. is interesting. Well, depends on your perspective. Um, anyway, in one of the previous problems, I think I said quantitative, but I might have circled qualitative. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'll go back and look at that in a minute. Um, well, anyway, in this problem, number of times late in the past six months, that is quantitative, and it's discrete, because you're just counting the number of times. It's not how long would that, how long, late were they. It's just whether or not they were uh, uh, late. So you count the number of times late in the uh, past six months, one time late, two times late, three times late, and so on. And that is a quantitative discrete variable. So it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, on up to any in the past six months, I guess, what would you have? About 120-something work days, assuming about 20 or so work days. Uh, a week, so maybe it could be a little higher than that. Uh, but anyway, the population, all employees, the parameter is the population mean, which is mu. The sample is the simple random sample of 100 employees. And the statistic is the sample mean, which is x bar. And that's going to equal the sum. That just means add them up of the x's divided by the sample size. And in this case, that's 2.74. It was this one, the uh, average uh, commute time problem. That's a quantitative variable, and it's continuous. But I can't remember. Check back and make sure that I circle quantitative and not qualitative. OK, so in a uh, random sample of 100 um, flights for airline A, 94 were on time. And 100 for airline B, 92 were on time. Go back and. Uh, Seems to work better if I make these changes over here. Not that it's perfect either way. So uh, an element is one flight. You could think of it as actually two sets of elements. One airline A flight uh, 
Okay. Well, I know what to do about this. I'm going to quit right now for tonight. See if I can uh, get computer services to help me figure out why that screen is blanking out on me like that. Maybe not. I'm not a quitter. I don't want to do that. I'll give this another try here. Okay, well anyway, on the element uh, one flight, oh, I know what that's doing. That's not good. I'm in conflict. There's two sets of tools, one's Tegrity, that's the one I'm trying to use. This isn't it, this uh, particular tool is uh, this stuff, which I would like to just... One flight for airline A or one flight airline B. Variable is uh, whether or not on time. I'm going to come down and skip to possible values and say those are yes or no. This is a qualitative variable with two categories. So it's qualitative and binomial. They're either on time or they're not. Population is all flights for A. And there's really a second population, which is all flights for airline B. The parameter then is the difference between the two sample proportions. Remember, I'm going to get is the proportion on time for A and the proportion on time for B. So the, what we're really looking at is the difference between the two population proportions. The difference between two population proportions. The sample, or really in this case samples, are 100, an SRS of 100, I'm just going to call it A flights, and an independent simple random sample of 100 B flights. So the statistic is P hat A minus P hat B, which is the difference between the two sample proportions. And so to get that for P hat A, we had the number of yeses in group A over the sample size in group A, or 94 
out of 100, which was, of course, 0.94. And for P hat B, we had the number of yeses in group B divided by the sample size of group B. And that was 92 out of 100, or 0.92. So P hat A minus P hat B is 0.94 minus 0.92, so 0 0.02 is the value for the statistic in this case. The difference between the two sample proportions. So in a random sample of 100 Russville homes, I'm trying to get, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Well, anyway, in 100 sample of uh, 100 Russville homes, 38 had humming. Uh, Bird finger, hummingbird feeders in the yard. Element is one Russellville home. Population, all Russellville homes. going to write all that again. I'm just going to write one, all, sum, or an SRS of 100 Russellville homes. Okay. And uh, possible values, um, let me come back here. The variable is uh, whether or not had a hummingbird feeder. Possible values are yes or no. That's qualitative and binomial. They either have them or they don't, and there's just two categories. The parameter is the population proportion. Again, if you have a qualitative variable, all you can get is the proportion in each category. With binomial, it's just the pi population proportion P. And then the statistic is the sample proportion which is p hat. That's equal to x over n which is 38 out of 100 or 0.38. Okay, so we have a random sample of uh, 300 two-bedroom apartments. Did I 
do that or not? Let's find out. Okay. So I've got one two bedroom apartment. Population will be all two bedroom apartments. And the sample is a simple random sample of 300 two bedroom apartments. The variable is, uh, well actually, there are two variables in this case. There is selling price which, by the way, is quantitative and continuous. We're not just counting. And the other variable is uh, the size of the apartment, which is also quantitative and continuous. Again, I'm just going to write here uh, one. Oh, I don't want to do that. I know that one won't work. Or at least not long. simple random sample. Um, the first variable was uh, the selling price, which we said, or which I said was quantitative, continuous. The second variable was the size in square feet, the house. That also is quantitative and continuous. So, both of them are quantitative and continuous. Okay. I know this is going to mess up in a minute. I can tell what's going on, but I'm going to try and uh, go pretty quickly on this. Selling price, you might have something like a hundred. No, that's not it. but I'm just going to do this one verbally and uh, you can kind of follow with me here. That I'm going to go through all these. The element was one two-bedroom apartment. The variables were selling price and size or square footage of the apartment. Those were both quantitative and continuous. Possible values for the selling price could be 120000 180000 46000 So just different sell uh, selling prices of, of apartments. Uh, square footage could be uh, 800 square feet, 8,000 square feet, eight, you know, 1,500 square feet, just possible values there. The uh, population was all, all two-bedroom apartments. The parameter is, I think I will write this one down if I can, just to get the symbol and everything on there for you. The parameter is the population correlation. I'm going to have to write fast. I know that didn't come out right. Which is rho. When you get correlations, it's when you have two quantitative variables and you're looking at the correlation there. Uh, the statistic is the sample correlation which is just R, and we'll get the formula for that um, next week. 
thinking, is it going to be next week or the week following? I think we'll get to it next week. Okay, so uh, here's just some basic correlations I'm going to get to. And uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't, uh, well, I know I didn't get to these in the uh, uh, lectures that I did earlier this evening. So I'll go ahead and do this now. And um, I may go back and, in fact, I do have a lecture that I can post on this. And uh, I will post that later this evening as well. But anyway, we have a set of numbers. I'm going to try and get the uh, marker to set up OK. And those numbers are, I'm just going to call it x sub i. x is the variable in this case, which is just whatever the number is. and it, has variables of three number values of 3, 7, 11, 3, 6, and 12. And uh, I want to compute the median. So to get the median, I'm going to have to put those numbers in order. I'll do that over here. 3, 3, 6, 7, 11, and 12. And the median is just the middle number in an ordered array. So I, I drew a line here, half the numbers above, half the numbers below. And I'm just going to go halfway in between those. So the median will be 6.5. I'm going to try and get as far as I can with this tonight. I may have to come back and record or and or re-record. Not sure when I'll have availability to do that. I'm going to just see if I can get the mean and the median, or sorry, the mean and the standard deviation really quickly here. The median would have been 6.5, halfway between uh, those two values in the middle. And I see something that might have an effect here. actually might help. We'll find out in a minute. That icon down there was uh, one of the two ways that this smart board, well, it's the way for the whole smart board. The stuff that I've been messing with down here is the annotation tools that come with Tegrity itself. I guess it's sometimes those uh, Here it comes again. I do not want that. Close. Give this another shot here. At least you know one thing. I can be persistent. 3, 7, 11, 3, 6, and 12. Okay, so anyway, uh, the sample mean, x bar, is just equal to the sum. That sigma just means add them up of the x. Is the I just means it's a random variable. It has different values, 3, 7, 11, 3, 6, and so on, divided by n. So we know n is 6 just because there are 6 values there. And <laughs> we know I'm persistent, but now how persistent is he? This could be a great experiment.
be trying to get a pattern here. Maybe whether or not I set the markers down. that coming back on like that's not good. Anyway, that sum is 42. So x bar is equal to the sum of the x's divided by n, or 42 divided by 6 is equal to 7. So to compute the standard deviation, I'm going to subtract the sample mean from each value of x, so 3 minus 7 is minus 4, 7 minus 7 is 0, 11 minus 7 is 4. So on. Now this sum ought to always add to 0, which means that you see 6 minus 7 is uh, 1. Three minus seven is minus four. I'll get this all together here in a second. Six minus seven is minus one. Okay, there. That has to sum to zero. I'm not sure where my head was on that one, but I have been in here for a while. Uh, so now I'm going to square each of those deviations. 16, 0, 16, 16, 1, and 25. That's a 16. And adding those up, let's see, uh, 48, 49. I'm getting 74. And so the sample standard deviation is equal to the square root of the sum of the x sub i minus x bar squared over n minus 1, which is equal to the square root of 74 divided by 6 minus 1, which is 5. I will get the calculator on that one. Getting that to be 3.85. What I'm doing now is uh, I'm uh, using the stat function on my calculator to uh, check my work. And if you want to follow along and uh, try this, what I did was on my uh, calculator, I hit the stat key. And then I hit edit. And when you hit edit, you should see at the top L1, L2, L3, some things like that. Those are just lists. There's six of them then there in default where you can put numbers. Well, in list one, I put the numbers from this problem, the 3, 7, 11, 3, 6, and 12. Just listed the, put those in list one. Now I hit stat again, arrow over to calc, one variable statistics, and I put second one. You can see to the um, upper left of the number one, it says L1. That just refers to list one in your data set. And then I hit enter. And uh, my sample standard deviation is, in fact, 3.847, which is what I got before. So I didn't make any calculation errors.
going to skip through here. I will, uh, at the very least, I may come back and videotape these. If not, the ones that I'm skipping. If not, I will at least um, post a solution that you can look at. But I did want to come down and do a couple that are a little bit different than what I just did. On number 15, it says in a random sample of our 100 students, 40 or two are taking at least one quantitative course. Compute the sample portion of students who are taking at least one quantitative course this semester. Show all work. We're trying to compute the sample proportion. That's just equal to x over n, or 42 out of 100 is 0 0.42. In 16, I have uh, in one group of uh, I have five business majors, and their number of correct were nine, four, nine, six, and nine. And let's see, I have 11. That's a pretty ugly looking six there. Um, I'm getting that to be 35. So x bar for group A. These are just x's for group A, is equal to the sum of the x's divided by n, or 35 divided by 5, which is 7. And then in group B, which is non business majors, I had 3. 10, 6, 3, and 9. And so adding those up, 13, 19, 22, 31. Check my work here. Okay. And so x bar b is equal to the sum of the x's divided by n which is 31 divided by 5. That's equal to 6.2. 6.2. And so we want to know the difference between the two sample means. That's just x bar a minus x bar b, which is 7 minus 6.2 is equal to 0.8. So to get the difference between the two sample means, I just had to compute the sample mean for each group and then get the difference between those two sample means. And then in 17, I have 100 business students. 78 are taking at least one quantitative course. So for, um, I'll try and do it the other way. to want to cooperate with that. So maybe I can work fast enough to use the other approach. So for uh, group A, I guess not. Maybe. For group A, we had a sample proportion which is equal to uh, the x's in group A divided by the sample in group A, which is 78 out of 100, or 0.78. For group B, p hat b is equal to the number in group A, the number of yeses divided by the sample size, or uh, 
32 out of 100, and that's 0 0.32, 0 0.32. And so we want to know our statistic is the difference between the two sample proportions, and that's equal to 0 0.78 minus 0 0.32, and that is equal to uh, 0.46. So this one we're talking about the difference between proportions. Get the sample proportion for group A, get the sample proportion for group B, then find the difference. That will be the difference between the two sample proportions. I'm going to go ahead and give this one a shot. To get the median, this is part A. That's not good. Still going to give it a shot. So to get the median, I'm going to put the numbers in order. 5, 6, 8, 9, and 12. And so and when you have an odd number of numbers, you just need to pick the one in the middle. The median is 8. The number that's in the middle, you have just as many numbers above 8 as you do below. So to compute the sample mean, you could leave them in that order and do it, but I'm going to just do this in the order presented in the problem. You do not have to put the numbers in order to compute the uh, mean and the standard deviation for the sample. So to get the sample mean, Add up the x's and divide by n. That looks like 40. Yeah. So the sample mean is 8. By the way, when you're working uh, an exam, and I'll try for homeworks as well, if you have to compute the standard deviation, when you computed the sample mean, there's a high, high likelihood, I'll, I'll try, to get the sample means to come out to be a whole number. And frequently, as I have here, a single digit whole number, but at least a whole number. That just will let us focus on what we're doing conceptually rather than focus on a lot of arithmetic. But I'm going to get the deviations here. Let me go ahead and write the formula for standard deviation over here. The square root of the sum of the squared deviations divided by n minus 1. So I'm going to get the deviations. I'm subtracting 8 from each number. I always make sure that I add this column uh, of numbers to get 0 as a check on my math. So that's 30 divided by 5 is 6, and the square root of that, I'm pretty sure, is 2.45. Again, I'm going to now use my calculator. You can listen with me here and uh, um, follow along and check this with your calculator if you would like. I'm hitting STAT.
That's uh, right below the delete button on your calculator, if you have an 84 anyway. And then I'm going to edit. And I can do this in any of the lists I want to, but I'm just going to go up to the top of list one, highlight the L1 and hit clear. So now list one is empty. And I'm going to put in 8, 5, 12, 9, and 6. Got those numbers in. Then I'm going to hit stat. Arrow over to calc. Just select enter because I want the statistics for one variable, one bar stats. My calculator now on a separate line says 1-VAR stats. And I'm going to put second L1. By the way, if, the, if you have something else in your calculator on a line and you did this, and you have something on there and one variable st stats is not on a line by itself, just hit enter and go back and go through the stat calc thing. That does have to be on a separate uh, line. Well, anyway, when I push the button there, I can see that x bar is equal to 8. And the sample standard deviation is 2.74. So, aha, I was back into my other problem there. Um, n minus 1 is 4. So now I'm going to have the square root of 30 divided by 4, and that's equal to 2.74. By the way, during an exam, I um, recommend that you do exactly what I just did. I worked the problem out. But either before or after I worked it out, I check things on my calculator just to make sure that I did all the arithmetic uh, correctly. You will, on an exam, have to work and show all your work just like I have here. So I've got the table, what I would call the calculation table here. You'll have to have that. For each formula, you'll have to have the symbol, enter the, the formula, enter the numbers into the formula, and the answer. Same thing here. Symbol, formula, Put the numbers into the formula. Hopefully you can subtract 5 minus 1 and get 4. And then get the uh, answer. Okay, right here, and I've worked this one before. I worked as a sample, and that's what it's going to say on the sheet when you get it. Thirteen. Let's say that we're calculating the mean, median, and standard deviation for a population. And I'll have it written this way on yours. I'll make that change. Twelve. Just trying to move through them too quickly there. Well, anyway. We will almost never have a problem like this where we're computing things for a population. But there will be a time when we'll see this a little later in the course. Um, usually, we'll just be estimating those. Since it's a population, we'll be estimating the population parameters. From We'll compute sample statistics and just estimate those. But there will be times, and there's one time later when it's theoretically nice for us to be able to do this. So while we're computing means and standard deviations, I want to show you how to calculate 
mean and standard deviation for a population should you have all of the values of the population. The median is just like it would be for the sample. Put the numbers in order. Since it's an even number of, even number of numbers, just draw a line between the halves there. So the median in this case is equal to uh, 6.5. Okay, so for the mean and the standard deviation of a population, 3, 7, 11, 3, 6, that's a 6 and a 12. That's 42. So now the population mean is mu, and that's equal to the sum of the x's divided by n. It's a large n, just designating that it's the size of a population, not of a sample. And that's equal to 42 divided by 6, which is 7. When I calculate the population standard deviation, it's sigma equals the square root of the sum of the x sub i minus mu squared over n, not subtracting the 1. For the population, you don't subtract 1 in the uh, denominator, and, and it's just the population size, as you've seen in the previous uh, problems I've worked here and in others. Uh, for the sample, you take the sample size, small n minus 1 there. So anyway, I still am going to get deviations, but this time I'm subtracting mu from each value of x. And I'm squaring those deviations. That's 74. So now we're going to have the square root of 74 divided by 6. Not subtracting the 1 now. And I got that to be I've worked everything now, but I'm going to go back here and check. If you know, you've got it in front of you, then I have worked them all, and you can move on to something else. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure I worked all of those. Okay, so there are the problems from the tutorial. You'll see when you're working through the uh, homework problems that there's a remarkable similarity between those and the problems that are here. So uh, work those. Make sure the other thing on your homework uh, assignment that there are some problems related to the first four, or not problems, questions related to the first four chapters in uh, How to Lie with Statistics. Um, I may have put this on the... Um, um, problem sheet itself, but I'll, I'll say it now. What I would recommend that you do is read all those questions before you read How to Lie with Statistics. Roughly, they're in the same order you'll come to the uh, information in the text. Um, so as you read the text, keep coming back to the questions and read the text with the purpose of answering those questions, and I think you'll... Uh, um, 
understand both the questions and the text a little bit more easily if you if you do it that way.